Uh, okay, that was an awesome lunch, uh, and it was worth a tweet. I don't tweet much, but I'll tweet about awesome food. Um, uh, next up, uh, we have uh, stragglers. I'm sure we'll have stragglers coming in from the uh, uh, other M-Hub, M-Hub tour. But next up, we have uh, Luisa Bicio giving, talking about uh, manufacturing the open source desktop computer. Luisa works at System76, a Linux computer manufacturer in Colorado, and is a big proponent of open source hardware and software. System76 manufactures an open source desktop computer from raw materials, and she's going to talk about how to build their machines and why open source uh, is important. Please welcome Louisa. I'm going to take this off stand since it's blocking my face. Okay, uh, so yes, I will be talking about manufacturing the open desktop computer. Um, and as you said, System76 is a Linux computer manufacturer based out of Denver, Colorado. This is Thaleo. This is the open source desktop computer which we are working to build. So we sell laptops, desktops, and servers. Um, we're starting with manufacturing the desktop first so we can get a good understanding of the flow of the manufacturing process and start, uh, once we have that built, then we'll move on to laptops. So we're really excited. Um, we just started um, shipping the desktops this year. So I will go into a little more detail about who System76 is why we're building an open source computer, and then we'll look at Thaleo's open hardware, and then we will talk about manufacturing. So we've been serving the Linux community for over 14 years. Our entire customer base uses Linux. And we believe the computer and operating system are the most powerful tools ever created. These are the tools that users will be using in order to, let's say, a roboticist to program the robot, or a health scientist to um, identify a cancer cell tissue, or for a rocket scientist to calculate space trajectory. So it's extremely important that these tools are powerful and efficient so that they have the best tools at hand. So why open source? Now, I want you to imagine a future where open source hardware and open source software exceed the expectations of those who once only trusted using proprietary. And when you think about this future, this is a future where your um, e everyday items are created by your friends and neighbors, where Etsy dominates uh, the gift delivery instead of Amazon, or where people are going to places like SparkFun and Adafruit for electronics instead of going to places like Best Buy. Um, and we're not that far from, from this already. Um, think, for example, actually, I'll take a poll. Um, imagine that each of you are on your way home tonight, and you want to get yourself a six-pack of beer. So if you don't like beer, pretend like you do for this brief moment. And I want you to raise your hand if the beer you're going to get is craft beer. And then I want you to raise your hand if the beer you're going to get is something like Budweiser. <laughs> <laughs> so the craft beer industry has done a really good job of exceeding expectations of something that you can get mass produced or get more um, easily. Um, and I want you to think about why some of you have chosen uh, craft beer over mass produced beer. And the pictures themselves tell a really great story. So not only, I'm assuming that most of you are choosing craft beer because you like the flavor, maybe you like the quality, maybe you like the styles or um, the amount of options that are out there. So that's one thing that really sets them apart. But also there are two great things um, that I think really are applicable to open source. One is um, craft beer, uh, craft brewers have almost a, a dialogue with their customers whenever they are um, showing off a new beer that they make. They make this beer. They present it to their customers and they're sitting down with them. They're listening really closely. Do they like it? Are there things I should change? Okay, let's, let's reduce the amount of hops. Let's try this style instead. They didn't really like the sour. So it's a really good conversation and a really close conversation with their customers. Another thing is the amount of collaboration that they're having, not just with their customers potentially by listening to them, but also with other brewers. And I think that that's really unique, um, the, that level of collaboration. They're entering competitions together. They're selling each other's beer at each other's brewery. 
Um, and I think that's really special. So in this future where open source dominates, and if we apply this same philosophy of craft brewing to open source hardware and software, the hope is that, thank you so much, <laughs> the hope is that if we can match the same level of thinking to open source hardware and software, that uh, perhaps people will have the same repulsive reaction to mass produced products or things that are proprietary that you all had to Budweiser. So how do we get there? I think there's two ways to get there. First, it's encouraging curiosity. And the second is making this uh, drive to pursue curiosity more approachable. So let's start with curiosity. There's a research study um, that talks about how important curiosity is. And it starts with a quote from the Wright brothers, the pioneers of the airplane. And there's a, a friend of the Wright brothers tells a reporter that he believes the Wright brothers will forever be remembered as a prime example of how far a person can get in life without having any special advantages. But the Wright brothers disagreed. They said, actually, the greatest thing in our favor was growing up in a family where there was always encouragement to pursue curiosity. In this same research study, they found that people who were able to uh, move up from social classes, become successful entrepreneurs, um, recover from life trauma, or leave a mark in history all shared one thing in common, and that was they um, were passionate about pursuing curiosity. Now, this is a small segment of people who are um, both curious enough to um, explore their curiosity um, and passionate and driven enough to do so. Um, but we can expand that reach by making curiosity more approachable. And I think that is led and driven by open source. By being involved in open source um, and making it more, I guess, giving that information more ready to the public, you are allowing more and more people to feel more comfortable and more encouraged to pursue their curiosities. Now for us, because we believe the computer and the operating system are the most powerful tools created, that means that it's very important, we see it as very important to make sure that um, the tools that people are using to build their projects are also open source. So Thaleo is where we're starting. And uh, we've been, like I said, in the Linux space for over 14 years, so we just started really delving into open hardware. So our plan is to start by replacing the embedded controllers with free and open source firmware to control functionality like thermals inside the computer. And actually, I should mention one, um, actually, let me think for a minute if I say that later. Okay. So. Um, for us, because we have a large customer base already, they're really depending on us, not only because of Linux, but because um, some of them still do rely on proprietary things like, let's say, um, NVIDIA for their work in CUDA. And so we can't really strip them of that. So for us, we have this challenge of, we really want to make an open source computer, um, but how do we respond to these customers and then work backwards so that we can start removing the proprietary functionality piece by piece so that by the end of it, we have a truly open source machine. So this is our daughter board. Um, I'll pass this around. So there are two of those in there. There's two different kinds. And the function of the daughter board is, uh, this is where we're starting to remove some of the proprietary functionality off the motherboard piece by piece. Let's go into, while that's being passed around, I can talk you through some of them. So, oh, this isn't showing. I'm trying to get KeyCAD to show on here, but I'm not really sure how to have it switch on the screen. Does anyone know by chance? Okay. Maybe if I do that. Nope. Okay. Well, it looks really cool on my screen. I'm kidding. Um, I wonder if I can turn it 
turn this around. Nope, okay. Okay, well, you'll see when it comes to you. Um, that's the whole point is to show you how cool it looks in KiCad. Okay, so there are two different boards. Uh, one of them is the, the SAS board, which has uh, four U.2 ports. And then on the other side, I'm still going through it, even though you can't see what I'm doing, sorry. Um, there's a single power connector and then uh, four SAS connectors as well. On the second daughter board, there is Oops. four SATA connectors and then a single um, power connector as well. There's also um, the embedded controller. Uh, two ports for connecting to the fan and then a USB connector for the embedded controller and then a power connector as well. So what the daughter board does is it um, controls things like the thermals, um, power, um, fan, and those kind of things. That's where we're starting for right now and then we're going to um, keep adding more and more to this. In addition to the how is this going to go? Okay, there. Okay, so in addition to uh, working on the daughter board, as we start removing more and more uh, proprietary functionality off, our engineers continue the challenge of how do they have more and more of these pieces open while running the computer at um, their maximum performance without throttling. So this is a photo of our engineer, Ian, who is talking about some of the tests they did in R&D. Um, as they were adding pieces to the, the daughter board so that they can get uh, proper airflow and so that they can have the um, proper layout components. Because what they wanted to do is have the smallest desktop computer possible while still having um, really powerful parts inside. So they reconfigured the layout over and over again, um, practicing, um, or not practicing, but running it at a max performance to see how much they can keep the uh, CPU cooled. And what they found was that everything matters in the cooling system design. So the size and shape of the ventilation holes made a big difference. The distance of the fan from the heat exchanger made a big difference. And the wall of the computer, the amount of cool air intake, and then the path of the air as it flowed through the computer and how all of that heat moved out. So this is what we used to, um, in our R&D testing, we did acrylic prototyping. We found that it was the most rapid way to test all of our theories. Um, once we felt like we had a good flow and the CPU was quiet, that everything could run at their max, um, their uh, maximum capacity, and we could also have everything uh, lay out really nicely in a uh, inside of the chassis, we moved over to metal design. I skip this next one, and so then we moved into metal and. Um, this is how our computers start. So they start out with these giant sheets of raw sheet metal. So they're probably about the size of this carpet here. And we receive a huge pack of these. And then we move them over to our laser here where we cut out the fans and the IO and the power button. And we move uh, those sheets over to the brake where we uh, bend metal. And this is what they look like. These are naked thaleos so that are not painted yet. Um, this is the first stage, and the second stage is getting them prepared for powder coating. And we went with powder coating because we found that it was um, the best for the environment. So uh, to prepare for powder coating, we dip it in acid. This acid is what deep cleans the metal so that the powder coat sticks to it better. And then the bucket next to that is where we rinse it. So after it's been dipped in acid and rinsed, we move it over to our oven to dry. And the powder-coated particles are attracted to the heat, so they stick much better when the, uh, the metal is hot. And then uh, this is our powder-coating area behind the uh, acid rinse bucket. So this is a photo of powder-coating. Um, we've only, I think we can probably only do just a couple at a time. Um, I've, so th when we talk about these being built by hand, they really are built by hand, one at a time. Uh, after it's been powder coated, we move it back into the oven, um, and once the substrate reaches 400 degrees, the 
powder flows and hardens um, and is cured. And then once that runs through the oven, it's completely dry and ready for the next step where we pass it through the laser to be cut. So this is uh, the Colorado Rockies and Thaleo, and underneath is Morse code for System 76. This is a photo of Joshua who's putting together the chassis. This is him applying the wood, it looks like. So it's made out of real wood pieces. You can choose between uh, walnut or maple. And uh, we actually partnered with the National Forest Foundation, so every purchase of a Thaleo plants a new tree. And because it's made of real wood, one of the things we learned the hard way was that uh, the color changes depending on when the wood was harvested. And we really liked the dark walnut, so, oh, thanks. Um, so we had to um, buy a bulk order of the walnut wood in October so that we have the right color. I'm gonna skip through some of these. Okay, so there's a lot of little features in Thaleo that are really neat because uh, we really want to build a, a computer for enthusiasts. And so there's p things like uh, we have extra screws that are built into the chassis so that if you want to add extra drives, you can uh, without having to search for screws. But also, this, rear ex this is a photo of our rear exhaust, which has planets, and this is where the planets were aligned at the start of the Unix epoch. <laughs> The bottom of the uh, computer also has planets, and those are where the planets were aligned uh, when our company was founded in November 2005. Um, our engineer saved this software that he built so you can enter any date in there and then see where the planets were aligned. So our hope is to get to a point where people are sending us their own Thaleo design so you could enter in your own date and see where the planets were aligned and then build that. Um, so when we talk about uh, releasing our designs open source, a lot of reporters get confused and they panic and they say, why would you release your product open source? <laughs> this is my favorite question. So I think it relates really nicely to beer, so I have one last beer story for you. Um, my husband is a, a brewer and he likes to make his own beer. And uh, there's one beer that he really loves, it's a Neapolitan stout. And when you drink it, you taste the chocolate and then later you taste the strawberry, and then it has a vanilla, creamy aftertaste. It's so good. But uh, whenever he finds a new brewery he likes, he brings him a six-pack of his Neapolitan stout. And I got really mad, and I said, why are you doing that? He said, what do you mean? I said, aren't you worried they're going to steal your beer? And then he thought that was weird. He said, so what? So what do you mean, so what? He said, uh, if they steal my beer, uh, he said, the recipe's available online anyway. And part of the fun is of brewing beer is seeing if you can uh, replicate that or see if you can make it better. And then he pointed out, if they make the uh, beer anyway, it's just another place where we can go to get this beer whenever he runs out. So in the end, he reminded me <laughs> that open source is about freedom, it's about choices, and it's about being able to empower more people to pursue their curiosities. That's it. Questions? What are the, some of the things that uh, System 76 uh, needs or would want to see in KiCad to facilitate their transition? That's a really good question for my product engineer. Um, <laughs> Actually, you know, I'm going to ask him that because I'm curious uh, if there's any kind of struggles that he's been running into. I know our next step is going into laptops, and they're already working on motherboard design. And I bet because that's such a, a much bigger, more challenging project that there's probably definitely some areas there that he needs some uh, KiCad support with. You mentioned slowly removing the proprietary bits piece by piece. Um, and I'm wondering what the next step in the desktop market or the desktop side of things is for the next piece that you're going to make open source or the next piece that you're going to work on replacing. That's a good question. I'm not really sure. I think right now um, they've really worked out how to get uh, more thermal controls for customers. 
And I think that so much of the product engineering attention has been moved to improving manufacturing um, because one of the things they, they uh, figured out was that some of the uh, drives, for example, weren't holding during shipping. So now all the product engineering attention is going towards, okay, how do we make this more stable? Um, and how do we, you know, if one of the things, for example, they're trying to figure out is adding more ports to the front. So I don't know um, what their next step is on the internal side. That's a good question, though. Hi, so um, uh, one thing that I'm curious about with electronics is a lot of the uh, specialty manufacturers or bigger companies require like NDAs for their products. How do you get around having to use some of those that are required and uh, being able to use that in your hardware? You mean like with our proprietary partners? We haven't run into that yet. Um, from their point of view, it's just the same as an enthusiast who's putting together a machine and, and using NVIDIA, or sorry, using uh, Intel pieces or using AMD. So we haven't run into that yet. Um, our goal, though, is to have um, closer conversations with people in the proprietary space like Intel and AMD and talk to them about different ways we can maybe encourage them to be more open. AMD is um, really good about that, but that is probably where our next step is. So if uh, they don't partner with us, then we're going to figure out how to do it. It looks like uh, from your presentation that you do a lot of manufacturing in-house from start to finish. Uh, what, what drove the decision to uh, design the product around you know, doing your own sheet metal and powder coating in-house versus working with uh, local partners or things like that? That's a great question and my favorite question. I'm happy you asked that. Um, so for us, we before we were manufacturing in-house, we were working with some other partners um, and it took months and months and months for them to push some of our requests through. For example, we had customers call us and say the power button was stuck or um, we need to have four GPU slots and yours only, only fits three. And so it would take so much negotiation for them to, to work with us and they would say, oh, we're well, not large enough of a company for us to work with you. So we weren't really being listened to and we found that this was the best way for us to be more responsive to our customers because the other thing is that we're very big on the community. In fact, um, we presented the, this idea of Thaleo to um, some of our social media fans and invited them out to our company to have a roundtable discussion around what kind of things they'd like to see in the computer. So sometimes on social media they might say, hey, we should actually move the rack to the top right instead of the top left. And now we're able to make those adjustments right away, test them, try them out, and then let the community know what the result of those are. So I think for us to be truly, truly open source and truly collaborative with the community, everything should be in-house. Great. Thank you, guys.